Welcome everyone. It's good to see you all. Yes. Good morning. Well, I am so delighted that we're going to <clears throat> we're going to see behind the screen this morning of the magic that Dorothy does for us that she's done for <clears throat> you know over a year, two years. These wonderful poems that that uh, enhance our um, our reflections, and uh, Dorothy's going to talk to us about how she uses poetry and what poetry is for her, and uh, and also share. We'll have to. Have everybody muted for a minute. Um, she's also going to share about how she uses poetry to get unstuck, and uh, the theme of her father. And and uh, this is uh, right around Father's Day, isn't it? It seems <laughs> like a perfect topic. Is is Father's Day international, or is that just uh, an American holiday? I guess, I guess we don't know. We'll have to find think, that out. I think it's an American holiday. It's Canadian too. Okay, so it exists in France too. Oh, <laughs> Father's Day is 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 getting a wide a wide audience. Yeah. So um, so we're going to be talking about fathers today, as as well as as poetry. Um, I'd, like to, I'd like to start just with a couple of thoughts about, um, about poetry as the royal road to the implicit. Um, a friend of mine hates poetry, absolutely hates it. A number of people hate poetry. And she says she hates it because it's it's a terrible tease. It it tells you things and then you don't understand it deliberately. And um, and she and she feels like it's like her older sisters teasing her and saying things that she doesn't understand and laughing at her for not understanding them. I don't think the poet is laughing at us. But, uh, but I thought about that and I thought, yes, poetry is deliberately elusive because it, it prevents you from um, understanding in the usual way, in a linear, rational way. And so it does tease you into going into that deeper, uh, implicit, nonlinear, um, bodily space of felt sense. And that's why it's so powerful. We use the word evocative for poetry. It, it evokes, it draws you, it brings you <clears throat> into the implicit world. And you find yourself there, understanding in a very different way. I find that when my clients are kind of stuck in a, a circular um, kind of thinking and expressing, I'll say back what I feel are the fire engine words in the way that I would say a poem. You can't stand it anymore. You are fed up. You want to quit, whatever it is. And I'll say it back um, the way that I would say a poem. And often the person hears themselves in a different way then. So uh, without any, any more musing about poetry in general, um, Dorothy, we're really looking forward to how you use it. Um, thank you, Lynn. 
Um, I poetry speaks to me in many different ways, um, and sometimes there is just the joy of the language. Um, but I must admit, when I um, decided to write um, poetry, I guess in the 19, I don't know, 80s or so, uh, when I was in my 30s, and the poem just trickled out of me about my father, my first poem that I remember writing about, um, which even back then was about getting through with communicating to him when he was behind the New York Times. Um, and um, I think I think I just, for me, saw it as a way to go to stuck places within me. Um, something about the medium, as Lynn was so um, saying, I, I mean, saying I so resonated with what she was saying about here, this medium that feels so difficult to understand so often. I'm not a natural when it comes to poetry. Like how to analyze and explain is, is not something that comes natural to me, even though I was a lit major in college. I just, it was a struggle to understand. And that, that just feels like a metaphor for growing up in my family. Like I couldn't, I just couldn't get through to those people. Yeah. But something, there's this push or drive in me to understand. And so the wish to be understood through poetry, and it just blended in with some, or fit something within me that I would choose a medium where it was hard to get through and that I would write something and people sometimes didn't understand what I was saying because I was so obtuse and I was so indirect and that was the feedback I'd often get about my poetry just say what you want to say um so we'll see later I was going to share two of my um poems and we'll see if they do if do communicate um but that's something I strive for and I think because I often start with this motivation of how can I get unstuck and it is so murky and so many jagged edges to starting from that place, particularly around a family member um, that you have such a long history with, that um, it's it's quite a challenge um, in that way. And the other thing that I notice um, for myself when I, I did write poetry that I took a few workshops and one workshop teacher said to me, the last one I took poetry with, um, said, you know, your poems are really narratives. I, I think you might want to try the memoir genre. And that really opened up something for me. It gave me a lot more, more freedom for what I wanted to do. So you'll see in those two poems, it's, there's, there's a definitely a, a narrative quality to them. Um, but um, what I'd like to do is to first, um, before I, I read the poem I chose, which is Late Poem to My Father by Sharon, Sharon Oles, um, I wanted to tell you what appealed to me about that poem was there's a shift in it that she makes in trying to understand her father. He, he was an alcoholic and she, struggled in many ways, um, but there's, in this poem, there's a shift for her um, that changes the way she views her father. And that was really helpful for me to see. And I, I brought that into, when I was searching for some poems I wrote about him last night, um, I realized I was led to poems where I felt, for me, there was a shift in a way of seeing him, which what a gift that is to be, when you're really stuck in a relationship with a, a parental figure or a parent over the years, and you find this, this other 
eyesight, this new eyesight, a way to see the relationship that's different and really does get through some of the murkiness. It's really exciting. Um, so before I read the poem, I just wanted to open it up a bit to all of you and see what your relationship to poetry is, what thoughts that, that you have um, in things I've said or things that, that you bring when you hear a poem, when you read a poem, just anything that might pop out for you. In fact, Meg's Glidewell here from Sarasota, been a participant in focusing for about 20 years. Um, yes, I've often, it seems to me, focusing is poetry in reverse. Because if you read a wonderfully stated, a poem that really speaks to you deeply, you get a felt sense. So I thought the, so I've always regarded bi-directional. So if somebody, I wonder if somebody has trouble, difficulty focusing, if they were, I don't know, would reading wonderful poetry and encouraging them to read poetry help them plug in? Anyway, thanks for the opportunity to say that. Yeah, I, I would agree with you that reading poetry, at least for me, can, can definitely um, help me to focus on something that is um, not, doesn't have the clarity. But I wonder what other people are thinking too. Thank you, Megs. Well, I'm, I'm thinking like what, what is really the definition of poetry? Because when I, when I heard Lynn say that some people hate poetry, it doesn't really make sense to me because there's such a wide variety of poetry. And, uh, and I'm sure they had, uh, I mean, I guess they had some experience with some poem that they didn't, that didn't resonate for them. And then they made it into, I hate poetry in general. So I'm, I'm wondering if you could, um, um, what, what is the definition for you? Like, what's the difference between prose and poetry? And I know that's like some people say that some kind of prose is like poetry and some paintings are like poetry and some are obviously not. So I'm, I'm wondering if uh, if that would be a, an, an inquiry here. <laughs> to yeah, I think the way... About. Right. I think that the way that, uh, that uh, the person, my, my friend thought of poetry uh, is um, communication that isn't direct and linear and rational and declarative. Communication that is meant to evoke uh, what's beneath the surface rather than uh, to tell you the uh, the story or the facts. And of course, um, poetry is uh, certainly in prose, in speeches, in our communication. For me, any, <clears throat> any kind of communication that is evocative is, is poetry, including uh, the handle words, um, in, in focusing in therapy, that there are times when I wish that what my clients were saying was uh, recorded. Sometimes it is recorded. Um, sometimes you'll, you'll, um, you'll uh, watch a video of a demo or a therapy session and you'll say, wow, that's, that's sheer poetry. So uh, I, <clears throat> I think that, that an academic distinction um, might not be as important for this exploration as our own distinctions of what uh, is evocative for us. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm listening, yeah. So. You're listening, but there's something more you want. Um, I'm, I'm not, I didn't say that to get like, this is it and this is not oh, it. Oh, 
Uh -huh. But more, more as a question and also a question in myself, like let's say just what you said, like you could hear a therapy session or you could read a news article. Right. And, and it evokes something more than just a storyline. Right. And also when you said less direct, I, th I thought, well, maybe sometimes more direct. Yes, but, exactly. But not in a way we are used to. That's right. Yes. It's that not in a way that we're used to that, um, that can be frustrating for some people if they like things to be the way they're used to, um, but can be exciting. And it can be very exciting for people who don't like it and then they get a glimpse into it. Wow. Um, Liz. Um, I used to be one of those people who was intimidated by poetry. And I don't know if it's that poetry has changed over the last decades. Mm -hmm. But my disappointment in poetry is that whenever I think about reading a poem, I'm always expecting something exciting. I'm expecting that language is going to be used really differently, like clay or like music. And what mm -hmm. I usually find in a lot of the poems that people seem to like, the man whose last name is White with a Y instead of an I is a great example. I find that it's prose, it's prose that's divided into lines to look like poetry. And I find that the language is prosaic and over sentimentalized and um, not experimental at all and uh, trying too hard. Um, I used to like William Carlos Williams, people who really condensed a lot of image and feeling into a, a very um, short, uh, well, condensed is, is the word. And now I find that the poetry that people like just kind of go, goes on and on. And I keep trying, you know, I keep hearing, for example, of Sharon Olds. And I'm reading some of her poetry, and it's just kind of what I'm talking about. It's not evocative enough. So I, I want my poetry to be more like I want my music to be. I want I, I want to hear a little Bartok. I want to hear a little Hindemith. I want to hear you a little Schoenberg. I, 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 I don't want to hear always kind of um, Mozart or something. I, you know what I mean? I think I think poets should try harder. That's what I think. <laughs> to write poetry that I like. Uh -huh. Yes. <laughs> well, when you're speaking, Liz, um, you remind me of some of my own journey around poetry that it shifted so much. I mean, it's gone in so many different directions. I mean, I remember I was like just sitting at the feet of my poetry, am I I'm a romantic poetry teacher? Or even my father, when he would do it at the dinner table, just quote the rhyme of the ancient mariner. I mean, the, the music in the romantic poems is um, you know, quite, quite moving. And I always strove for that. I just couldn't get the music it's a real art and a real skill like I suppose composers are very different people who write music and you know what they the lyric quality of the music that they might aim for or the disjunctions in some of the more modern music um but you know music has this quality I mean poetry has this quality that it can sweep you away with the musical quality. Um, it's something I strove for, but really couldn't get that. It's like, I don't have the ear for it. But what I want to, I think, in, invite you to do is to have all of the reactions and responses like Liz is referring to, <laughs> and to be with it, own it, just let yourself have them. Um, 
I can get very angry at a poem that I just don't understand and not, you know, why is this poet doing this? You know, I almost personalize it. Um, but um, I think ultimately what I want to invite you to do, and we're going to um, later when we get to the attunement, I want to invite you to see what images come up for you is to like use it in a focusing way of just, just what you get in touch with on the inside. I feel like any vehicle that helps us come to a greater understanding of something within us that we haven't been able to reach or have access for has a validity to it. And mm -hmm. so it might not be through poetry. I mean, that's why we're blessed with so many ways of um, artistry, you know, so many different vehicles to express ourselves. Um, and I mean, I just remember when that, remember when this poem about my father a long time ago trickled out, I was like, I was staying at that time, my boyfriend was a poet and I just ran around like so excited to just have these words trickle out um, and have meaning for me and state something that um, was somewhat close to the surface, but not ready to come out. Um, mm -hmm. So um, it's almost like inviting you to, in part, have your views, but also put the views aside when we go inside and just let any images surface for you and not not worry about definitions. Um, that That's the way I think of it. Like, ultimately, it's for us. Maybe this would be a good time to read uh, Sharon Old's poem and for us to, to do what you're saying and just uh, open to what it brings. And, and as you're saying that there are kind of two levels of response. The one of, I like it, I don't like it and or I understand it, I don't understand it. And, and another level of just letting it wash over you and see what it brings from inside you, what the feeling of it is. Sounds good. Um, late poem to my father, Sharon Olds. Suddenly I thought of you as a child in that house, the unlit rooms and the hot fireplace with the man in front of it, silent. You move through the heavy air to your physical beauty, a boy of seven, helpless, smart. There were things the man did near you and he was your father, the mole by which you were made. Down in the cellar, the barrels of sweet apples picked at their peak from the tree, rotted and rotted. And past the cellar door, the creek ran and ran and something was not given to you and something was taken from you that you were born with so that even at 30 and 40, you set the oil, oily medicine to your lips every night, the poison to help you drop down unconscious. I always thought the point was what you did was what you did to us as a grown man. But then I remembered that I remembered that child being formed in front of the fire, the tiny bones inside his soul twisted in green stick fractures, the small tendons that hold the heart in place snapped. And what they did to you, you did not do to me. When I love you now, I like to think that I am giving my love directly to that boy in the fiery room as it could reach him in time. Mm 
as if it could reach him in time. Well, thank you, Dorothy. <clears throat> it's powerful. I feel the shift so clearly. Mm. <clears throat> I don't know if, yeah. Thank you very much. Mm. <clears throat> How do you experience the shift, Sophie? <clears throat> In different ways when you, I can't remember exactly the words, but when you, it's as if you come closer to your father, to your father's history and what happened to him. And you are able to love him through that connection and what he was able to not pass on. <clears throat> mm. um, so your focus shifts in a way, that's the, that's the way I perceive. Um, and I do feel the love in it, the, the shift in, in your love um, in the reality of what you now see. Mm -hmm. That's what I. I yeah. Now this is Sharon. This is Sharon Ohl's poem. Okay. I, yes. Yeah. I just no wanted, yours. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I I hear what you're saying. Mm -hmm. There there was something that Saul Bellow said about greatness being the ability to not hand on, pass on um, the trauma that, that you've lived reminded me of that. I, I also thought of my own father as a child and what he went through. I think for me, what it, what it uh, came to me is that um, I think a quality in poems of, uh, of having more than one dimension. Like, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right now, but it's like looking at a person, not only uh, from a perspective, what we think of them, who they are today, but also seeing them in different, um, I think in different um, times in their lives. Mm -hmm. And I think that's in some way, anyway, more true that we are all not just uh, the, the whatever 60 year old, but also the two year old and also mm -hmm. the 12 year old. And so, the, so for me, the poem sort of represents an expression of that. And in my own, I guess, uh, relationship to my family, I think uh, one benefit from therapy <laughs> or having whatever work I did was uh, to not see the parent and, and my siblings just as this good or bad fairy tale characters, but as, as people who also have their history and their strengths and weaknesses and sort of in a more dimensional way that's more true than just, oh, he was bad, he was an alcoholic, or he was whatever, withdrawn, or he only read the newspaper and didn't pay attention to me. But also, and, and that's, I think, one way to see them in different uh, developmental stages in their lives. Thank you, Robert, for saying this. It's reminding me how poetry or painting or kind of has a way to grab the whole of it mm. without in a description or without saying there's this and that. And this yes, and that. yes, yes, yes. Right. The whole of it is in there um, with different times, with different dimensions. So. Mm. Yes, I, I like that, Sophie. It's like Jean Genlin saying, what's, what's the feeling of this whole thing? Mm. Well, and I think that's also going back to what you said, like your friend saying uh, poetry is less direct. It's, mm. it's, it's actually captures somehow more. Yes, yes. 
And and also the, the, the healing power of poetry in the sense that to me, poetry, that there are these different levels as were mentioned. It can I can think of poetry as some, something very academic. And I remember when I was at school, I used to learn the poets and especially the English and American poets. And I thought, mm, I didn't quite understand. But then when I, I, I found myself at a time being in contact with something that that I was feeling very deep inside, and I had to stop and 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 felt sense. And then a poem would come from that, and the words would come from me going going back and forth from the felt sensing and finding the word and 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 as Jean says, the word that is is wanting to is implying and until I found that word. So 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 then when I did something something changed in me. And if it had to do with 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 a relationship like in this case with your poem Dorothy that I so resonated with and it, it took me to to these two dimensions of first wanting to know more about what it was like for you, your your experience, and then also resonating with my experience, with my relationship with my father. So, so poems for me have these 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 different levels, these these different dimensions, and 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 for me, a very forward moving thing when I write. When I write. Well, I cannot call myself a poet, of course, but what, what, when I write what comes from inside, and for me, that is poetry, too. Yeah. Mm. I don't think you have to worry about calling yourself a poet. I mean, that's what I'm finding over the years is like just claiming that we all have a right to, to write. And mm. we all have a right to express through writing as we do if we're painters or ceramicists or whatever, or singers and writers of song, whatever vehicle that stirs us to express ourselves, um, we have a right. And I try not to worry too much about, um, is this something that will be acceptable to the public or fit a certain definition, but to really allow that self-expression to come out without the critic present. Mm. Yes, um, Lenore? I was interesting what you just said um, about the critic also, because I like to write haikus. I find haikus are very easy, a much more, I have to find the word for it, but it, it get I can be more in touch with what's happening inside through not expressing as much because when I try to write a poem with many words, it becomes more difficult for me. I for whatever the reasons are, uh, maybe the judgment or whatnot, but the <clears throat> getting it right. Whereas the haiku, finding one word to express an inner feeling or sense um, comes more naturally for me. Um, I also want to, it reminded me, uh, the, the greatest teacher I had through all my education was in high school. She was a poet, Daisy Alden, her name was, and we would sit in, our, in the classroom. She said, I just want you to become aware of all your senses and just write it down in a stream of consciousness. Everything you hear, everything you taste, everything you see, smell, touch, you know, just write it down. And then I was able to write poetry for a while. And then I went to college, of course, <laughs> and they destroyed it. Your sentence structure is not correct. Uh, <laughs> punctuations. And it was terrible for me. It was, I, I couldn't write after that for a while. So the high school teacher really opened me up and it was really a class and felt sense in a sense, right? And I was able to write from there, but it was sad. Then I started to write again a little bit, but not much, but haikus work for me. <laughs> um, yes, Liz. I can relate to the haiku situation because I, also do things best when there's a tight structure 
And I kind of hate myself for that. And I, I write a lot of songs. And so I write a lot of lyrics. And I'm lyrics have to be really tight. And I and it's a real OCD exercise because I rhyme everything compulsively. And I feel like poets, I envy them because they could say anything. They 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 have it easy. They don't have to rhyme anymore. You could just write whatever you want, you know, and, and call it a poem. And I can't do that. And I'm actually in my songwriting trying to get more loose, you know, as some of us are, are saying that I realized, gee, I don't have to exactly rhyme in uh you know, in a in a song, I have this Stephen Sondheim OCD neurosis about how the, everything has to be like a like a puzzle. Um, but I also just wanted to say that it's funny to me that you picked this poem, Dorothy, because just completely unrelated. I read that poem yesterday, and I'd never read poetry, but I read that poem because I was looking up images of Sharon Old's long gray hair because I have a fantasy that someday, if I'm patient enough, I will have long gray hair like Sharon Olds. And then maybe I will be more of a poet. <laughs> what an image. There's a poem right there. Well, there is something about, the, about not being inhibited yes. that goes with the poetry and that goes with, you know, I'm just going to have this wild long gray hair and not care about violating old lady hair norms. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about breaking out of a mold. It reminds me of the, the poem about uh, when I'm old, I'll wear purple. And all of my friends at some point in history, I forget when we're quoting that poem, it, <laughs> took over everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe, uh, maybe this is a good time, uh, Dorothy, for you to, to read us your poems so that we get a chance to really take them in before we go into our breakout rooms. Okay. The writing is, I realized, a little light, but with my eyesight, <laughs> bear with me. Um, um, Remember now, I'm pre, um, I don't know what the word is, justification or something, um, that um, I found that, that I like story poems. Um, so um, I'm telling a story to get to something. And what was amazing to me is that, um, and I stayed up so late last night looking, looking at different poems. And um, I just, this whole idea that um, that I've been looking to celebrate my father for a long time, like after he passed away when I was 36 and let's see, it was 19, 1981, um, I started writing some poems about him. And I did reach a place of appreciation and love, and then I lost it again. And so it's so circular as we do our focusing, um, how much it takes us to these deep places. Um, and I'm just, I had this sense of excitement last night of like rediscovering um, some things about the relationship. Um, this one first is um, receiving a gift from my father. And I just want to say, I looked up patience, the patience plant that he grew very often. And I always got confused. Is it patience or impatience? So when I looked it up on Google, they, they use both. So I'll stick with the patience name. Um, let's see. Um, receiving a gift from my father. In September, you dig up the patience from your garden, fill big brown pots and wrap each with tin foil. Carefully, you fit those into a box to keep their straight, to keep them straight for the drive into my apartment. 
you buzz and I come to help carry up all those long spindly stem forget me like pink flowers. We sit on the couch and talk of your future in Sun City and how the everyday swim will make your left side better again and how you will throw that hickory cane back in my attic toy box where it belongs and after the sun slant hints of dusk he gets up before he walks out the door he reminds me about patience, how they will fast if they don't, how they will last if they don't get water every day. And I think once again, how strange he gives his undisciplined daughter plants that ask for so much care. And I think it was such a pleasure to find that poem. Um, it's, it's just to find this gift and how important it was to bring this to me. It's just amazing how memory can blot out the good, how in in anything, like I've noticed with the focusing, how much I've focused on areas of pain. And it's the poetry that has been a, a source of finding something different. That's just so exciting to me. One more. Um, I'm so sorry about my eyesight. Um, okay. Light, light does come through trees. I had been away for many years, married and unmarried, but mother and father never moved. I come home late morning and stay in the street a while to get a full view of the weathered clapboard house. No matter how brilliant the grass and the tulip trees, my eye, eyes go toward the dark of the unreflecting brown wood. I walk through every room, how dark they are in midday. My father planted the shrubs years before I was born, almost shutting out all possibility of natural light. I sleep in my old room, placing my head at the backboard, close to the window and wake early to sunlight. With each move of the dense maple, hugging the window, I see new shapes spread across my bare skin. It took some years away to figure out such a simple thing, a way of getting closer to the light. Um, so I'm real thankful for those discoveries that kept me up till two in the morning looking for these poems. Um, but just something in my heart really wanted to share them because it, it's, it's not about making perfect poems. It's only you know what really speaks to you and what really evokes something in you. And you feel it like in the focusing way you know, as I approach these, this activity of looking for this, these poems, I could feel this old clenching in my body, like from my throat to my belly, 
I just feel it clench up and I could feel in this process of discovery of there are beautiful gems in my relationship with my father. And I could feel like a loosening inside. And for that, I'm grateful. And I want to offer you that possibility for yourself. So um, I want to invite you maybe to close your eyes for a minute before we go. In Dorothy, be before we, uh, before we um, tune into ourselves, could you just read the last line again? I, I oh. missed something. Oh, okay. Um, it took some years away to figure out such a simple thing, a way of getting closer to the light. It's a beautiful line. Dorothy, is it okay if I say that that was just so, so beautiful, both of those poems and your style is amazing? How mm -hmm. you tell the story and then at the end you come up with that sort of conclusion and I just mm -hmm. the gaps were also very beautiful <clears throat> when you were taking a moment to read it added to the to the poem and I just love your style and it really touched me so thank you for sharing that thank you Steph thank you I can feel the shift in your poem too <laughs> <laughs> right. absolutely Um, so if there's, you know, any other words, please take this time. Otherwise we'll, we'll go into, um, a little attunement of back to closing your eyes and just, um, you take a deep breath. It just helps let go of the attention. You take your hands and just squeeze them tight and, and let them go. And the same with your shoulders, if that helps you to squeeze and just let them go back and around and let them drop. And just let the breath pass through your whole body, out to your fingertips, down to your feet. And just see if any images, just give yourself a little piece of quiet and silence and see if anything comes up. and. If it doesn't, that's okay too. Um, and if it does, take a minute to jot a few words down or an image, a scene, an experience that evokes something within you. And we'll just take another minute to allow for that. and let your eyes open. Hi, hi, welcome everybody. Ah, let's take a breath uh, to make that transition uh, to this world. And, <laughs> and then we'd love to hear anything that you'd like to share from your breakout rooms. Vivian, is it okay if I just share about the 3D movie? Sure. Vivian had so much wisdom. I was just soaking it in. But one of the things that she said that was so beautiful is that poetry is like a 3D written word. I just want to share, Dorothy, that um, I have been thinking a lot about my father, who is now 93. And I know that now I'm here now, and he's here now, and there's a way that I want to come near, but in nearer, but in a safe way. Mm -hmm. And when we got into, a, um, I always want to call it the waiting room, but it's not the waiting room, the, the other room, whatever the, the, the room, when we sent to our room. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
What is it? What's the name? A breakout room. Oh, thank you. The breakout room. Um, <laughs> we both, Leonor and I, wanted to write. We, we, we were in the middle of the wanting to write. We gave each other the time to write. And I have been looking for that way to come nearer um, and to ask my father some question I may have when he's not here, when we are both not here. And um, I feel I have come closer to know what and how to come near in a safe way. Mm. So thank you very much. That's a wonderful image of coming near. Um, I really love that image. It reminds me when my father, he'd go to Arizona Sun City um, in his later years and when in, in the fall and the fall before he did pass away, he passed away in, in Arizona. I remember walking around the block, like I would come from the city to Westchester and take these walks around the block, he with his cane. And I would, I would say, oh, maybe this time, maybe this time, you know, this whole idea of, I want to come near, I want to come nearer. So it's just a, a very beautiful image with so much emotion. <laughs> mm. Thank you, thank you. And like Leonor was saying, gentle, be gentle. So maybe that's a line to, the, to a new poem. I want to come nearer. I want to say too with Sophie, yeah, with the gentleness, because it's such a vulnerable place, you know, come near up carefully, gently, because there was so much there that wasn't talked about. Actually, it's a line to uh, a hymn, nearer my God to thee. Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking like how, how writing poetry could... Uh, relate to clearing a space where we can name mm -hmm. things as they appear without, mm -hmm. at least initially without really choosing if it's a feeling or something that happened or a thought or and and I keep uh, thinking of uh, I, I forgot who it was talking about her high school teacher who mm -hmm. It, uh, writing poems that way. Yes, right. right. And uh, and I think uh, I think in some way it's almost like poems are more, not more, are very precise handles. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. we can and then we can see how those lines or the whole poem resonates or doesn't. Mm -hmm. and I, I think a lot of out making and writing poetry is also done in that way that that's something that we make something whether it's a shape or a line or a world and then check for a resonance and then keep shaping it until it really fits yes yeah in fact robert you I, you made me just recall realize that one of the nice if you really want to bore someone to death, speak to them with perfect articulation and grammar in every single sentence and phrase. And one of the wonders of poetry is it melts away the, 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 the urge to be the perfect. And yes, so that's condensed because you cannot condense in everyday language. Prose, somebody was talking about I think it was Sophie later earlier mentioned prose, but yeah, beware of politeness. Poetry can allows you to remove many constraints that lock the language into patterns that's hard to get out of. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that. <laughs> I loved what you said. <laughs> it brings such freedom and 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 even creating and inventing words <laughs> for our, for what we are trying to say and feeling and sensing. Yes. <laughs> well, Jean, Jean loved to do that, right? To create words. If I could share, um, Robert, something you said about stuckness 
Um, it's just a new way of looking at at the emo, like calling an emotion an emotion for one. It just like that idea, and and then taking away the judgment. Like I have such judgment toward the word and the concept of stuckness, but just if you view it more openly, give it more space, it, it, I don't have to surround it with such a critical eye mm. and could open up into something, give it a chance to open up into something. Mm. I love that idea of thinking about stuckness as a different thing, as a different aspect, like a, like a, a pause that we haven't consciously asked for. Mm. Well, also what you just said about uh, Dorothy, the viewing it more openly, and there was another sentence you said that I don't remember correctly. I think that's in some way, a, or it could be a, a, a definition of poetry. Mm. Right. It could also be a waiting for something more to come. <laughs> a waiting and a being with what's there to come out. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, as I stuck, I was once writing a set of guidelines and I thought it would be really easy at the start. And I got through nine out of the 10. And number 10, I got stuck, stuck, stuck. It took me. Hmm, nine days to get unstuck. And I realized, cause I did not want to admit what number 10 involved. I was stuck cause I, I didn't want to admit that. <laughs> I did not want to acknowledge something. And it was, uh, still annoys me, <laughs> but yeah, days, days. On, uh, <clears throat> Uh, this August, we're going to have a special program like we did a couple of years ago of uh, writing. So each week, there'll be a different uh, reflection on, on writing and an opportunity for us to, to write. And it would be wonderful, Dorothy, if you would do one on writing poetry and maybe other people will help uh, Create, uh, create a space where we could write, maybe even write a poem together as a group. I didn't mean to take us out of the moment there, but I was just imagining all the potential of dipping into writing poetry. That's what I was thinking, that, that, that uh, pause. Mm -hmm. That, I, at least, I mean, that's what happened for me, just, feeling into potential. Yes, yes, yes. So it, um, very exciting. Right. It was a very rich pause. Mm -hmm. You know, this has really helped me learn that what gets in the way of me in poetry is the way I judge myself and the way I judge the writing. And it prevents me from really being able to get something out of it because I'm judging myself thinking, what am I not getting here? Mm. something I'm not getting I'm supposed to get there's going to be like a test at the end of this and I'm going to have to like say this is what <laughs> it is. And like, this is this this whole process this whole thing has really helped so yeah one of one of the things I could um suggest Steph is um like as you have a focusing partner maybe with that partner you could read share what you've written um Reading out loud something you've written just has a whole different a way of it coming into being and you see things about it that you don't see when you read it to yourself. Um, yeah. Just just a thought. <laughs> so sweet because I don't write poetry, but now I feel like I have to because you're inviting me to. So thank you, Dorothy. <laughs> uh, Dorothy, can I ask you one thing? Yeah. This is Shashi. Uh, what happened just before you thought of writing this poem? The the one the two poems I read about 
the, the, the second one, either one, like what happens just before that you say, oh, I need to sit down and write this feeling or this something is coming or something is dripping out of my pen or what do you, what do you? <laughs> I forget. If it, you can remember, I mean, you yeah. know. It, it did help to take a workshop because you're compelled. You, it's like being in school. You have to, not have to, but you are compelled. You're paying money, et cetera. Um, and <clears throat> it's, it is such a good feeling to be in a group and overcome the the fear of rejection of your writing. No. Um, so I'm not sure if those came from that place. Um, what I suspect after my father passed away, that was such a painful time to be able to access the grief. Um, what I suspect is that it came out of a place of wanting to access um, memories that were, um, can't think of the word, memories that were um, connecting to a joyful place with him. Um, that's what I'm suspecting, but it was in the 1980s, so I'm not sure. <laughs> the, the reason I ask this, because I, I lost my father when I was four years old. Oh, wow. There has been a big hole, a big hole that nobody has been able to ever fill. Mm. And I try to write about it, but there's still a big hole, you know? Mm. So... As Robert said, maybe the clear space around it or something. I'm trying to grab on to something. I'm trying to like get up, grabbing on to something. Yeah. And not just be uh, sobbing and not just be sad. Mm -hmm. uh, you, know? you know, okay. Um, if I can say in response to what you just said, um, Maybe it would be helpful to think about things you would like to do with him. Or sometimes um, in my Buddhist group, you know, Thich Nhat Hanh, the leader, died. And people frequently talk about taking a walk with him. <laughs> like when you're walking mindfully, you know, uh, think of walking with Thai, you know. Or, in fact... Um, I was going to do that. Um, I was going to go to the beach in the, the next time I go and take a walk with my father on the beach. I'm going to do that. <laughs> it's beautiful, June. Um, I think, so, Sashi, too, just, just that you're bringing it out today, bring out to the group, and that you're looking for some words or images or a place to be with this, a walk to take, or it has so much meaning. And it, it's like telling yourself, like, pay attention, spend more time, because it, it does take time. That's what I find, the writing. It's like leaving a space for yourself that you might not ordinarily leave this process of, of writing and you'd be amazed at what comes forward if you schedule in two hours for yourself and words and thoughts about about your father and and I do encourage the sharing to somebody you feel safe with of sharing those words with another um I hi Dorothy thanks for for sharing so much of your story today. Um, I just remember, uh, Jenglin, I, when I do it, it's the experience of, he said something that we already know what's implicit in our wanting. It's already there, we can imagine it. So I like that idea. It's that it's going towards it, but you already know because it's the missing bit. I like that. It's reclaiming some of that space. 
Yeah, I think he's he used I seem to recall he used the words that we fill in the blanks of our yes, experience. Yes. 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 You know, I just want to say, Sasha, I'm glad you I'm glad you said that the whole this because I'm when I write, I'm always writing about something very specific. And I so you've given me a whole new conceptual geometry to go mm -hmm. with. So mm -hmm. thanks. That's I wrote that down so I'd be sure not to forget it. Yeah. Conceptual geometry. <laughs> That's beautiful, yes. There's a, a demo that uh, that Jean did uh, on YouTube called um, Ripped Out. And and the the person is talking about something was ripped out of her. And it's very poetic. You might want to take a look at it. Is, is it a YouTube about this? Yeah, you, a YouTube. Right. It's called Ripped Out. Mm -hmm. with, yeah. With Jen Lind, with Eugene mm -hmm. Jen. Yeah. I just Googled ripped out Jean Gendlin and it comes up. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds very well, it's Time for us to stop. And um, thank you all so much. And Dorothy, thank you so much. Thank you, Dorothy. It's amazing. Very, very good. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye now, everybody. Yeah. Wow.